All right, so good afternoon once again. And we're going to start today's lesson now. All right, so just a moment while I try to share my screen. All right, so just let me know if you're seeing the presentation. Yes, miss. All right, so welcome to your Principles of Business lesson, and I am your teacher, Miss Morgan. So before we jump right into the lesson, just a brief overview of what the syllabus entails. So we actually have 10 sections, all right? Section one, the nature of business. Section two, internal organizational environment. Section three, establishing a business. Section four, legal aspects of business. Section five, production. Section six, marketing. Section seven, logistics and supply chain. Section eight, business finance. Section nine, role of government in an economy. And section 10, technology and the global business environment. So for today, we're actually going to be starting with section 10, the nature of business. And we're going to be covering three topics. The first one, the barter system. The second one, the role of money. And the third, instruments of exchange. As such, we have three objectives to look at. So at the end of the lesson, you should be able to explain the development of barter. Also, you should be able to describe the role of money. And finally, you should be able to identify the instruments of exchange. So we're going to begin with the barter system. And for that, I have a video. All right, so just a moment while I try to share the video. Are you seeing the video now? Yes, miss. All right. So let me go ahead. When we lived in caves, there were no shopping malls. And people's manners were Neanderthal. No bodegas, no delis, no corner stores. Shopping trips turned into tugs of war. When not having pool, got this man mangled. He thought he'd try an easier angle. I'll give you this for that, that for this, we'll make a trade called barter. I'll give you this for that, that for this, we'll have it made with barter. Now barter worked well, at least in theory, but a wallet full of yaks could make you weary. Making change for a cow wasn't easy to master, unless you were ready for an utter disaster. Shiny shells were far more portable, why not use them for what's affordable? I'll give you this for that, that for this, with shiny shells why barter? I'll give you this for that, that for this, shelling out shells is smarter. For farmers in ancient Mesopotamia, the barley they grew was the money mania. When hauling big sacks put their backs in traction, they invented coins to lighten transactions. Now when a man had a debt to settle, he'd dig out some coins made of precious metal. I'll give you this for that, that for this, silver or gold or copper. I'll give you this for that, that for this, with coins you're a smarter shopper. Then China made money even more desirous, printing it on paper made of crushed papyrus. Take one from column A and one from column B, the Chinese paid their checks in paper currency. When Columbus set out on that famous charter, he had no paper money, so he had to barter. He took a loss of beats for currency, so barter played a part in our discovery. Balboa and Pizarro and Sebastian Cabot, even Coronado had the trading habit. I'll give you this for that, that for this, they loaded up with gold and parted. I'll give you this for that, 
that for this, and soon the whole world was charted. Today we use cash and spend with ardor, but that doesn't mean we don't still barter. When a football team needs an all-pro guard, or a kid like you is into trading cards, take this for that, that for this. Bills and coins are smarter, but when you pay for that, remember this, it all started out with barter. All right. So according to the video, what do you understand about the barter system? How did it work? Um, miss the exchange stuff for stuff. They didn't have money, so yeah. Right, yes, that is correct. So there was an exchange of goods or services for other goods or services without the use of money. All right, so we're going to continue with the lesson. So before we jump directly into the barter system, in order to barter, we needed to have goods, right? And these goods needed to be produced. Now, production, it involves using natural resources, you know, human effort, tools, and other resources as well to make um, goods and services that we needed to um, satisfy our needs and our wants. No needs can be defined as those goods or services that are necessary for our survival, where on the other hand, wants may be defined as goods and services that we desire, but they are not necessary to our survival. No, an example of a need, of course, is water. And an example of a want may be a particular brand of sneakers for schools, right? Like Clark's, for example, right? It is not necessary. So a good can be defined as a physical product, right? One that we can touch, it's tangible. Or it can be defined as a service, right? Which is a product that we experience, it is intangible. Now, a tangible commodity, it can be held, as I mentioned, it can be seen or touched. Whereas an intangible commodity, it cannot be seen, held or touched but it can be experienced, right? For example, when you go to the hairdresser, you want to get your hair done, at the end of the day, you can have a wonderful experience getting your hair done. Now, many years ago, before the development of business activities, our ancestors, they produced all the things they needed or wanted for themselves. Now, um, an example would be that they grow or they hunt for the food that they needed they build their own places or of shelter they make um their own clothes from wool and they use animal skin to protect themselves from the cold now anything that they were um in need of right they were unable to produce or consume themselves they would um exchange using the barter system now, when they provide it for themselves and their family members, this is called subsistence production. Now, few people or few communities, they were able to produce very much, right? They did not have the necessary skills and access to other resources. For example, um, some of the villages, they were located on good farmland, while others were located in woodland areas, right? And they were able to supply the market with timber, which is what they needed to make their spear rods, right? And to make their boats and to build their shelters. Now, similarly, some people and some communities, they were better at making spears and pottery and other items. So over time, what happened was that people began to specialize in those um, productive activities that they were best able to undertake, right, with limited natural and um, other resources that were available. Now, um, this specialization, it allowed the communities to produce more food or pots or other items than they needed for themselves and that is it resulted in a surplus that they could now exchange or trade with other people or communities for the goods and services that they were able to supply now um, as the individuals or the entire communities began to focus their efforts on the production of one or more of a particular good 
they were able to produce far more in total than they had previously when they tried to produce everything that they needed for their own survival. Now, over time, um, this repetition of the same productive task, it would increase their skills, right? They're used to it, they're doing it every single day, right? It increased their skills, it increased their abilities and their knowledge in that chosen field of specialization. So not only did it allow them to produce more, but it also allowed them um, to offer their skills and their know-how to others, right? And this would be a service. For example, carpenters, you also have um, plasters back in the day, iron mongers, weavers, and painters. They would exchange their services. Now, specialization in production um, would not only require communities to exchange their different goods with each other, but also to exchange their services as well. Now, as a result, each of those communities was able to enjoy a wider variety of goods and services than they did before specialization and businesses also began to develop as a result of this. All right, so before we move on to the next section, just a little lesson check. So you're required to categorize each of the following item as a good or a service and to give the reasons for your answer. All right, so I will go through each individually. Healthcare, is it a good or a service? A service, Miss. It is a service, correct. Um, online banking. Service. Mm -hmm. Cellular phone. Goods. Pedicure. Service. Mm -hmm. Food. Goods. Transportation service water service no water is a good all right water is a good and remember you know the good is the one that is tangible that we can see all right we can hold we can hold a bottle of water all right and the final one education service is a service right because it is intangible all right so in the table above which of the items listed would you classify as needs and which one as wants all right so give me two of them that you would say <clears throat> are needs which two from the list do we need Oh, from the list that we just did yes water and i don't remember anymore uh you're not able to see uh my screen no miss. you're not seeing it I, uh, my apologies i thought you were able to see the screen all right so how about now can you see yes miss all right good yes so which um give me another one so you said water which other and, one is and, and, food. and food right why are they needs because you can't live without them can't live without them right so we need them for our survival all right and give me two ones pedicure and Pedi definitely Cellular phone. Cellular. Hmm. You're sure cellular phone is a want? Well. <laughs> yes, it is a want. It is correct. But um, nowadays, we operate as if our cell phones, right, are needs. Right? We can't go anywhere without them. But it is indeed a want. It is not necessary for our survival. All right. Any questions so far about the lesson? No, miss. All right, good. So we're going to be proceeding now to the development of the barter system. All right, so as mentioned earlier, the earliest um, form of exchange was barter. And this involved the trading of one good or service for another of equal value without the use of money. So that is the important part, right? For example, you can swap your watch for a classmate's bag, right? And then the two of you would have engaged in barter. 
Now, the actual items that are being exchanged, they are not relevant. So you might be exchanging a pen for a pencil instead. But the essential fact is that barter involves the exchange of similar items or items of similar perceived value, right? We think the value of each is the same um, as agreed by the two individuals who are doing the exchange. Um, however, though, the barter system, it had some key limitations that caused issues for our ancestors. Um, for example, imagine a farmer, right? A farmer had produced a surplus of bananas and they wanted to trade for an ox. Now, that farmer would have to travel to a local market to find somebody who supplied axes, all right? But how many bananas would the ox maker want in return for one ox, right? We need to determine that rate of exchange. And what if the ox maker only wanted mangoes? They cannot do the exchange, right? Because we need to have a double, well, you're going to learn about it later. You needed to have a double coincidence of wants, right? Um, you need to have what I want. I need to have what you want in order for the exchange to take place. Now, the bananas would probably um, have perished, right, or rot rotted um, by the time the farmer had got to another market and searched for an ox maker who was in need of the same bananas. So you can see where we had a problem here. So barter, it had um, major disadvantages that greatly outweighed its benefits. All right, so a critical thinking session here. So I want for you to identify situations where you engage in barter with friends, right? Or anybody for that matter, it could be family members as well. What were the key factors that made the exchange possible? Right, why were you able to um, barter? So identify the situation and then tell me a factor that made the exchange possible. I mean, so do you mean a factor that made it possible? All right, so you could say, you know, that person had what you wanted, you had what the person wanted, you both agreed that the item was of a similar value, etc. So I'm supposed to tell you what what, what we... a situation and a situation where you would have bartered with someone, you would have exchanged something with somebody else without using money. Have you ever bartered with your? I say you have siblings. Have you ever bartered with them? Yes, miss. Uh, what was the item that you traded? Or items? Miss, I gave. My sister a pants and I get back a pants for her. You got back another pants. All right. Did you both agree that it was of similar value? Yes, yes. Right. And you both wanted the items that you exchanged? Yes, yes. Yes. So those are the factors that made the exchange possible. And the next situation, identify a situation where you refuse to make a swap. So somebody wanted to exchange something with you, but you did not want to make that exchange. Why did you turn down their offer? Have you have you ever been in such a situation where somebody wanted to exchange something with you but you did not want to make the exchange? Yes, yes but I don't remember. I don't remember, I know. Okay, so an example would be where somebody comes to you, you know, wanting to exchange um say a pen, right? A blue ink pen for a black ink pen. But what happened oh, was that experience. Come again. I have an experience. Oh, you have one. Right, go ahead. Like at school, someone mm -hmm. wanted to exchange an ordinary, regular tree pen with my RSV. Yeah. Right, right. So why did you turn down the offer? Because my one more expensive. Yours was more expensive, right? So they did not have the same perceived value right so yes that is a problem that was experienced um when using the barter system back in the day as well all right so thank you for sharing um your experiences so now we're going to be looking at the advantages of the barter system and here we have them specialization wider variety of goods and services greater variety in diet and also disposal of service 
All right, so the first one, specialization. So um, Barta encouraged specialization, as I explained earlier, right? Specialization in production and better use of available resources. So persons could focus on producing a particular good that they were good at producing. And then when they're finished, they could go ahead and exchange with somebody who specializes in producing something else. For example, I could specialize in um, producing corn, somebody else specializes in producing cassava, right? And then we could go ahead now and make that exchange. So it encouraged specialization. For the second one, wider variety of goods and services. So Barta increased the total volume and also the variety of goods and services that were available for trade. And the third one, greater variety in diet. So it allowed um, greater variety in diet um, because early families, they could exchange different food items with each other. So as with the example earlier, I could have my corn and I exchange with someone who specializes in producing cassava. I could also exchange my corn with somebody who makes um, produces bananas, et cetera, et cetera. So at the end of the day, I'm not just um, consuming corn, right? I have a greater variety in my diet from which to choose from. I have some corn, I have some cassava, I have some bananas in my diet as well. And for the final one, disposal of surplus, so it provided a means of um, means to avoid losing any surplus that was produced. So um, before barter, any surplus that was produced would perish, right? It would be thrown away or it would rot. But because you have the barter system, now you could exchange that surplus and receive other items. So you could dispose of your surplus in that way. All right, so those are some of the advantages of the barter system. Any questions? No, miss. All right, so we're all clear. All right, so now on to the problems that were experienced, right, using the barter system. So here we have them, the need for double coincidence of wants, also difficulty establishing an agreed rate of exchange, indivisibility of goods, and the inability to store wealth. All right, so the first one, the need for a double coincidence of wants. So um, finding someone to trade um, your items with was one of the major limitations of the barter system, right? Persons were required to find buyers who not only wanted the surplus that they needed um, for their sale, but could also supply the items or the items that they wanted in exchange. Okay, so that is there needed to be a double coincidence of wants for the exchange to take place. So you needed to have what I want and I needed to have what you want, right? And we should be willing to exchange before we can barter. But that is not always the case with the barter system and hence it was a problem. Right, do you understand that one? The need for a double coincidence of wants? Yes, yes. All right, so the next one now, difficulty establishing an agreed rate of exchange. All right, so it was difficult to establish an agreed um, rate of exchange in the barter system. So even if um, an individual could be found who was willing to engage in barter, they still had to face the problem of um, agreeing on an appropriate value and rate of exchange between the items that they wish to trade. For example, how many bananas is an ox worth, right? How many chickens is a cow worth? I'm sure you would not exchange one chicken for one cow, right? Even though they're same units, one item for another one item, they're different in weight. So it was difficult to establish an agreed rate of exchange, right? And this was a major problem of the barter system. So next we have indivisibility of goods. So um, some of the items, they were difficult to trade because um, it is impossible to divide them into smaller parts, right? And still maintain the quality of the good. For example, to provide a change um, when two items being exchanged are not of equal value. It was difficult to provide change like we do now with money. Um, an example would be that it would not be sensible to take the wheels off a cart, right? in order to exchange it for a less valuable set of pots. 
Um, this is because the card only has value with the wheels. So if you remove the wheels, the card will, well, it wouldn't make any sense to make that exchange, right? The card would be useless. So the same would apply um, to sign up a boat into smaller sections as only producing half or even a pair of trousers, right? You're exchanging an item and you want to split the pants in two. It wouldn't make any sense, all right? Because you cannot wear one pant leg, all right? So there is the issue of the indivisibility of goods. And the final one that we have here is the inability to store wealth. All right, so um, a carpenter, they could store their surplus tables, they could store their surplus chairs, right? But they would need to have a large um, storeroom to, to store these items, all right? But imagine that you are trying to store meats or even fruits and vegetables for long periods of time. What would happen to these items? They would perish, right? So they would quickly perish and they would lose their value um, especially in countries with hot climates. For example, um, in the Caribbean, right? The Caribbean countries, we have a tropical climate. Those items will perish very easily. So here you can see that barter, it was and it remains a very inefficient method of exchange, right? Our ancestors, they therefore um, needed to find something that overcame the problems that were associated with the barter system in order to make trade much more easier. Now, that commodity, it had to be something that everyone would be willing to um, accept in exchange for all other goods and services, right? The search for such a commodity led to the development of money, which is what we're going to be looking at next. Now, before we move on to the role of money, another lesson check. So the first question, define the term barter. Miss, um, barter is an exchange of goods and services. All right. It's incomplete. Completed? Without the use of money? Right, that is the most important part. So barter is the exchange of goods and services or other goods and services without the use of money. And the next question give two benefits of the barter system or two advantages of the barter system. Disposal of surplus this value. Mm -hmm. right. Disposal of surplus and greater variety in life. Greater variety of, yes, the greater variety in debt. Very good. So now we're actually going to be moving on to the role of money. All right. So money, it is actually a medium of exchange that is generally accepted within society. And a vast range of different objects had been used as a medium of exchange at one time or another in the past in different countries, right? Now, these have ranged from beads, you also had feathers, you also had, had uh, shells, grain, and even small stones were used. Now, this was followed by the use of gold and silver and other precious metals, which in turn led to the development of coins and also banks in the form of goldsmiths. Now, um, goldsmiths, they had vaults, right, in which they kept gold, they also kept silver and other precious metals, and they, um, metals they used to make coins, jewelry, and other items. Now, other people would also deposit their coins and other holdings of precious metals with goldsmiths for safe, safekeeping. Now, in return, the goldsmiths, they would issue each customer with a written paper receipt noting how much their individual deposits were worth, etc. Now, the customers, they could then return at a later date to exchange the paper receipts for their deposits of um, precious metals. Now, alternately, another method is that they could exchange them for goods and services with other people who could instead take the paper receipts to the goldsmiths and retrieve the valuable metals, right? So these receipts were used to make, used to make payments as well. 
Now, the receipts that were issued by the goldsmiths, they became the earliest form of paper money. Now, eventually, people no longer required coins to be made of precious metals, right, or notes to be a claim to deposits, deposits of gold and silver, right? So instead, the notes and the coins that were not backed by precious metals became generally accepted as money. Um, over time, however, people slowly discovered um, through a process of trial and error, of course, that some of the items um, fulfilled the functions of money better than others. All right, so now we're going to be looking at the functions of money. Now for a commodity, in this case, a commodity is money, for a commodity to be recognized and accepted as um, money, it must be able to perform the following functions. So medium of exchange, measure of value, store of value, and also a means of deferred payment. So we're going to be looking at the first one, a medium, as a medium of exchange. All right, so medium of exchange, that is the main function of money. So it is a commodity that everyone accepts, right, in exchange for all other goods and services um, anywhere they want to make purchases, all right? And the next one is measure of value. So this means that the value of the prices of all other goods and services can be expressed in units of money, right? An item can be worth $50, $100, $5,000, etc. And this overcame the need to fix rates of exchange between every different item in the barter system. The next one was um, store of value. So money, it should not perish or lose its value over relatively short periods of time, right? So it should be durable. Unless, of course, prices of items um, increase rapidly. So money tends to hold its value over time, over a period of time. And this, essentially, it allowed um, money to be saved or stored and used to make payments at a later date. So remember, in the barter system, you could not always store your items. You could not always store the tomatoes and the onions. Those items that were um, perishable, but we can store money and we can use it at a later date, right? And the final one, a money as a means of deferred payment. So if money holds its value, then it allows people to purchase items or borrow money and postpone making the payments right now and make the payments instead in the future. So this allowed for the development of the banking system and businesses to sell goods on buy now, pay later credit terms, right? Such as higher purchase. So you can purchase the item now and you pay for it in the future um, in small installments. Are any questions about the functions of money? Yeah. All right, so now we're actually going to be moving on to the characteristics of money. Now, the characteristics, um, money, sorry, money has um, distinctive characteristics. And um, if a commodity is able to perform the functions of money well, it must possess these characteristics. So it must be portable, it is divisible, it is acceptable, it is durable, it is scarce and it is also homogeneous. All right, so the first one, it is portable. So money generally is not bulky unless you're carrying it in small, um, small amounts. It's not bulky or heavy and it can be easily transported in our wallets, in our purses, in our pockets, etc. So it is portable. The next one is that money is divisible. So it can be divided into um, smaller or into fractional units for example dollars can be divided up into cents all right so if we have a hundred dollars it can be divided into two um fifty dollars right um paper money as we call it or notes similarly if we have fifty dollars we can further divide that into two twenty dollars and a ten dollars right so money is divisible next we have acceptable so money is acceptable by people and businesses in exchange for other goods and services right so it is acceptable everywhere 
and the next one is that it is durable so it doesn't perish or it doesn't wear out quickly right um the coins and the banknotes they're actually designed to last and any worn bank notes they are usually replaced and the next one is that it is scarce so it has value because it is limited or restricted in supply so we don't have a lot of money going around all right and the final one is that it is homogeneous so it is easily recognizable as money right so coins and banknotes they're similar in appearance and feel the same size the same shape right same weight etc so as soon as you see money you can recognize it for what it is and here we have another critical thinking um, segment. So why might a business that sells goods on credit use money as a standard for deferred payment? Miss me because me because um I might have so. All right, so to help you out a bit, remember that um, a function of money is that it acts, <coughs> sorry, it acts as a standard for deferred payments. So what does that mean? Standard of what is? Standard for deferred payment. It's on the screen. Um, you should be able to see it. I'm seeing it meaning that it's a different method of paying. Um, no, that's not the answer I'm looking for. All right. When we say it is a standard for deferred payment, we're saying that you can take the items now and pay for it later. All right. So you don't have to make payments right away. For example, when you take out items on higher purchase, right? You make an initial down payment, yes, but you don't have to pay um, pay the full amount for the item right away. You can pay for it in small installments later. So to answer the question, why might a business that sells good on credit use money um, as a standard for deferred payment? Because it would allow their customers to take the items now and pay for it at a later date it's like when like like courts or that they can sit right right very good very good example right so courts and singer those places that give you items on higher purchase all right yes, or right. even in your own community the small shops you go to the shops and you say you know what trust me this item until you know until next week friday when we get paid all right so you're taking the item now, but you're not paying for it now. You're going to pay for it at a later date. So money allowed for that to take place. All right. Are we clear? Yes, yes. All right. So moving on now, we're going to be looking at another lesson check. So it's just a simple true or false activity. All right. So first one, money is described as a medium of exchange. True or false? True true yes next money was used during the barter system false false good c one of the characteristics of money is that it is divisible true true and d money in and of itself has no value false actually that is true money in and of itself is just paper if you look at it it's just um paper Right, but we place value on the money to differentiate whether it's a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, five thousand dollars. So the money itself is actually paper. All right, it, it does it mean like if money of value, like it. Oh, say, yes, it like it has, yes, it has face back value, but it doesn't have any intrinsic value, right? Like gold, okay, okay it's it is just paper. All right, so this one. <clears throat> It's true. All right. So before we jump on to the final objective where we're going to be looking at the instruments of exchange, any questions so far about the barter system or about the role of money? Yes. All right. So we're going to move right along. 
<clears throat> so instruments of exchange. So an instrument of exchange is essentially anything that enables a transaction to take place, all right? When you're buying and selling goods or services, you need to make payment, all right? So any, anything that we use to make this payment can be considered as an instrument of exchange. Now the instrument- Could you go back to the time, please? Oh, instruments of exchange? I was just writing and finishing. Oh, all right. Um, also, I've posted some notes in the classroom, in the course room, all right? Section one, lesson one. So it will contain notes on all the topics that we're doing today. So you can write it from that. The, the PowerPoint only has bullets, all right? So you wouldn't get as much details. However, I will be explaining as I have been doing. So the notes are actually um, I have created a document and posted it in the course room. So you can access that. All right. So as I was saying, um, instruments of exchange, they came about because there was a need for a more efficient and secure method of making payment. So as business activity and trade increased, more notes and coins were needed to make payments. All right, but carrying around lots of notes and coins around, it was difficult and it was very risky, right? So you're making yourself prone to theft. Physical money, it was bulky when you carry it around in large quantities and it could be easily lost or stolen. Now, um, sending notes, right? Paper notes and coins over long distances um, to businesses located many, many miles away or even in other countries, right, overseas, that was also very very problematic so it was very slow and it was expensive and the money could easily go missing right before it reaches its final destination all right so um as a result it was difficult for businesses to sell their goods and services to any customer who did not live nearby so this limited the scope to expand um the business's production and also to expand their sales to different regions or to different countries. So um, in order to overcome these problems, different instruments of exchange have been developed over time to make payments with money much quicker, easier, and much more secure. All right, so now um, before we jump right into listing the instruments of exchange, we're going to be looking at the development and the role of the banking system. So business organizations known as banks, all right, business organizations or financial institutions known as banks, initially they developed to provide a safe place for people and um, businesses to deposit their notes and their coins. Now, in return, what they would do is that they would issue claims to each customer with a paper claim to their deposit. So you could claim some money that you have placed in the bank. Now, um, however, the banks noticed that most people and businesses, they would add to their deposits over time, right, instead of withdrawing. So they add to their deposits over time. They would really withdraw their accounts in full so the banks were now able to start lending out some of the money that they held to other people and businesses, right? So you deposit your savings, the bank now they start to lend it. So in this way, <clears throat> the bank um, created more money, right? Simply by recording the value of the loans made into the books of accounts. For example, um, imagine Imagine that a small clothing maker was granted a loan from a bank for $100 to buy a sewing machine. The bank would simply record the loan as a credit of $100 to the bank account of the clothing maker. So it did not need to issue it with notes and coins. So it did not need to actually to give actual money, right? They just required it in that person's account. Um, to use the loan, um, to issue, sorry, to use the loan, um, make the payments to the supplier of the sewing machine, the clothing maker could then ask the bank to credit the bank account of the equipment supplier with $100 and debit their account by the same amount. 
Now, the transfer of money between the bank accounts did not require any notes and coins to actually change hands. So the transfers between bank accounts are now the main way uh, money is created and exchanged in modern economies. So notes and coins, they make up very little of the total supply of money in different countries today, and they are declining in use, right? Because we are quickly becoming a cashless society, right? So everything now is a money transfer. We're not necessarily using, well, we're moving towards a cashless society. Like online banking? Yes, online banking, which we're going to be looking at later, telebanking and all of those things, right? Not necessarily using the actual cash, the actual coins and paper notes. All right, so now we're going to be identifying the different instruments of exchange. So many different instruments of exchange, they are used um, today in trade to make and receive payments in exchange for goods and services. All right, so they include checks, you know, credit cards, debit cards, electronic bank transfers, etc. And we will look at a more extensive list later. So the first um, instrument of exchange that we're going to be looking at is actually checks. And we're going to be looking at this one in depth. So a check, a check, sorry, is an instrument of payment where an individual or a company directs his or her bank to pay someone a specific amount of money from his or her bank account. So checks are generally, they're valid for no more than six months, right? Um, some important features um, that need to be on a check include a check number. So every check needs to have a number, right? And they are numbered chronologically, right? And this is number, number it is normally located in the top right corner of each check. So the check number, it helps with record keeping and it guards against risk of fraud or theft of a check from an individual's checkbook. Um, another important feature of a check um, is the date, right? So the date, the month, and the year must be on the check. So we have check number, we have date. Another feature is the name of the recipient of the check, otherwise known as the payee. So the person who is receiving the check is known as the payee. Next. And next, another feature of the check is the amount of money being paid out to the recipient. It must be written in words and it must be written in actual figures. All right. Another feature is the signature of the person issuing the check. So the person issuing the check is known as the drawer. So remember, the person receiving the check is the payee. The person issuing the check is the drawer. drawer all right. And next. Another important feature of the check is the bank from which the money is being drawn. And the bank from which the money is being drawn is known as the drawee, right? So, so far we have three um, important individuals to consider. The person who is receiving the check, the payee, the person issuing the check, the drawer, and the bank from which the money is being drawn known as the drawee. Another important feature that must be on the check is the account number of the drawer, right? And also the check stub or the, um, the counter foil is another feature of the check. So here we have an actual check, an example of an actual check. So this is where you would insert the date, you insert what is purchased and the value of the purchase and your signature would go here. And this is the perforated line. So this is a section where you would tear off. This section remains in your book, right? Well, this section is given to the payee, which is the person who is receiving the check. So you would insert your name here as the drawer, insert the name of the payee, and it goes here, insert the appropriate date here. And this is a check number that we mentioned earlier. All right, in this section, you would insert the transaction amount in numbers, right? So you need to write out the actual figures. Your signature would also go on this section of the check, and you would insert the transaction amount here in words, all right? So those are some of the important features of a check. All right, any questions so far before we move along? No, All right. So another lesson check. 
All right, so here we have it. Sam um, had a total of $10,000 in bank deposits. He prepared a check ordering one penny bank limited to pay out $5,000 to Electronics Limited for the purchase of a flat screen television. Which party to this transaction functions as the drawer, the drawee, and the payee? So you can read it once more and then indicate um, who's the drawer, the drawee, and the payee. All right, ready? All right, so A, who's the drawer? Um, Sam? Yes, that is correct. All right, so remember the drawer is the person who is issuing the check. And in this case, that would be Sam. Um, next question, who's the drawee? Miss from the store. Which store? Electronics Limited? No. The draw you would be one penny bank limited. Right. So one penny bank limited would be the draw ye. I remember the draw ye is the bank that is issuing the mm -hmm. check. So that leaves the payee, which is who? Electronics Limited. Electronics Limited. Right. Correct. So once again, the drawer is Sam, the person issuing the check. The drawee would be One Penny Bank Limited, the bank that is issuing the check. And also the payee would be Electronics Limited, which is the person or in this case, the organization receiving the check. All right. So that's it for lesson check four. So now we're going to proceed to the types of checks. And here we have um, them, four types of checks. So we have open checks, we have cross checks, we have post dated checks, and we also have dishonored checks. All right, so we're going to be starting with the first one, which is the open check. So an open check, it is uncrossed, right? And what this means is that it does not have two parallel lines that are drawn across it. No open checks, they're not considered to be very safe because if it is lost or stolen, somebody besides the payee, somebody besides the payee may be able to cash the checks. All right, so anybody can cash a check. Now, the banks, therefore, they encourage the use of cross checks rather than open checks. An open check, it can be taken to the bank to be converted into cash immediately or it can be paid directly into your bank account, all right? So that's it for open check. It's not very safe, right? But it allows you to receive cash immediately or the money can be transferred into your bank account. Any questions about the open check? All right, so the next type of check that we have here is actually the crossed check. So a crossed check, it has two parallel lines, right? Um, on the face of the check with or without words written in it. Now in general, crossing words such as a account of payee and company are not negotiable, are written between the parallel lines. Now in special crossing, a bank's name is written. Now in addition, the words AC, payee are not negotiable may be included in a specially crossed check. Now a cross check, it cannot be cashed at the bank, right? It cannot be cashed at the bank, unlike the open check, which can be cashed at the bank. It cannot be cashed at the bank. It can only be paid into the payee's account, right? So cross checks, they're considered to be safer than the open checks. All right, do you understand the cross check? Yes, yes. All right, so now we're going to move along to the post-dated check. 
All right, so a check that is dated um, sometime in the future is called a post dated check. So remember, post means after. It's a post dated check. So the bank it will not process the check before the specified date. It has to be after that date. So for example, um, on November 25, 2018, John writes out a check to James, um, ordering his bank to process the payment to James on or after January 16, 2019. So should James attempt to cash the check before January 16, 2019, it will not be processed. He would have to wait until after January 16, 2019 to go and process that check. So that is what a post dated check is, right? It is dated um, sometime in the future. And the final one that we have here is the dishonored check, right? Most commonly known as a bounced check, right? So um, a check that is paid by the drawer's bank is said to be honored. So if the drawer's bank pays a check, it is honored. A check that has not been paid by the drawer's bank is said to be dishonored, right? Or it's said to bounce. Now, a check can bounce for a number of reasons. Can you think of any reason? Let if the account number isn't there. If the account number isn't there or if it's incorrect. All right, yes. All right, so that is one reason. There are several. I'm going to outline some of them now. So the first one is that the amount of money that is stated on the check is more than the amount of money in the jars checking account all right so you may state on your check um to pay out a sum of five hundred thousand dollars but you only have four hundred thousand dollars in your checking account that check can bounce right you're writing a check for more than what you have another reason why a check may bounce is that the jar cancelled or stopped payment of the check all right so it was cancelled it cannot receive payment anymore so it bounces Another reason is that the drawer could have um, closed their bank account before the check um, was presented for payment. All right, so they no longer have a bank account. Um, it has been closed, the check can bounce. And there, there are many, many other reasons. All right, but those are just a few. All right, so any questions about um, the check before we proceed to um, other common instruments of exchange? understand okay so now we're going to look at um the common instruments of exchange they include credit card debit card bill of exchange electronic transfer internet banking telebanking um, money order bank draft telegraphic money transfer m money mobile money or mobile wallets and also e-commerce all right so on to the first one which is credit card so the credit card is actually a small plastic card and it is utilized as a form of payment in business transactions. So the credit card, what they would do is to allow individuals to purchase goods and services immediately and pay back the credit card company at a later date. Now the credit card company, they will charge the customer interest, right? If his or her account is not fully paid off by the end of the month, right? And interest payments on credit cards can be very high, right? As high as thirty-five percent interest. Um. So when when they say the credit card max, that means um, they need to pay the money to the company. No, that means that you have reached your limit. Credit cards are usually given a limit on how much you can spend, right? So you may be given fifty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, um, you name it. Uh, once you reach that limit, you have maxed your credit card and you cannot get any more unless you go to the bank and you increase your credit card limit. Okay. Yes. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, so the next one we have is your debit card, right? So unlike the credit card, a debit card is when you're using your actual money, right? Money that you actually have in your account. So the credit card, the debit card, sorry, the debit card again, like the credit card, it is a small plastic card, right? The debit card is a small plastic card that is given to persons who have commercial bank accounts, right? 
some commercial banks in Jamaica include JN Bank, mm -hmm. right, NCB as well. Okay, those are examples of commercial banks. So this allows individuals to pay the goods or services without having to physically carry around, you know, notes and coins, right? You can just carry around that single card. It doesn't matter how many, how much money you have in your account. So generally. It is a safe method to use, right? Since each customer, they need to have a PIN right, before they can use the card. So not any, anybody can use your card. They need to have a PIN, right? Um, and that PIN, it must be entered before you make a purchase. Now, in order to um, facilitate payment, by this means, the stores must be equipped with a machine that is rented out by the banks, right? Now, some small businesses, especially, they do not accept payment by debit card, right? Given that there is a banking fee that is attached to each customer's use of the machine. Um, as a result of these individuals, they can withdraw cash from um, automated teller machines or ATMs using their debit cards, right? So you can use the debit card to make payments and also to withdraw.